of 2024. Um, if this is the first time that you are joining a live, I want to remind everyone that it is a live stream, which means that if you want the best quality of your video, you are going to need to turn your settings up on your side. Basically, that means that I'm going to be shooting in high definition. Um, and so everything is clear on my side. It will be even clearer on your side if you change your settings on your phone. I'm just going to quickly give the camera a wipe because it looks like it's a little bit blurry and I feel like I put my finger on it. There we go. It's a bit better. I'm going to wait for a couple more people to join us. Also, don't forget that you can put questions in the chat as we go along. I will be looking back at that as well so that we can see um, some of the questions that I know that you'll put in there as we go along. This serves as an introduction to Matric and what to expect. I'm going to teach you some of the basics so that when you get to your first lesson um, next week and you sort of dive straight in, which I'm sure a lot of your... Um, teachers are going to start immediately, um, you're going to know more and you're going to be a lot more comfortable with the content. And um, these live lessons are generally um, sort of a basic outline for you. If you're all keen to join my membership, then please do. That's when these live lessons are far more frequent. And um, if you are a member of the membership, then you get access to the study guide for free. You get access to all the members only lives, their videos. You get to request topics to do. So I think that's really exciting. Okay, so um, one last thing before we begin. Um, I would love it if you shared it with your friends so that they can join this live, but don't worry if you miss this live, um, then it's going to be recorded and then placed up on my YouTube channel afterwards. Okay, right. So here we go. Um, we're going to do the basics of DNA and we're going to do the basics of the very first lesson that you would do in class. So first things first, we need to start off with DNA and where we actually find it and what is its purpose. So I think at this point, we all know that every cell has a nucleus. And so here would be our nucleus. And inside our nucleus, if I were to draw this a little bit clearer, you will have a chromatin network. Right. Now, the chromatin network is the formal name that we give to the long string of DNA that sits inside your nucleus. Now, when a cell is doing its everyday job and it's not replicating and it's not doing anything, it stays in this long like spaghetti-like structure here called the chromatin network. However, if we were to zoom in on a piece of the chromatin network, you will start to see the more classic um, structures of DNA and that double helix look. But before I get to that and the, the structures of DNA and what it's made up of, I also want to clarify what exactly is the chromatin network and how does it look in different stages? So right now, this is us zooming in on the nucleus, and this is the chromatin network over here. Now, the chromatin network can also condense, and it condenses to form these structures, which you may be familiar with. These are called chromosomes. Now, chromosomes only appear when we're going through replication which means when we are making another cell. And you are going to have 46 of these chromosomes. And so what that basically means is we take the chromatin network and we chop it up into 46 pieces and they condense, which basically means that if you look really closely, one of these chromosomes is made up of a tightly, tightly compacted and condensed piece of the chromatin network. And so would this one be. And so you would have 46 of these. Why do you have 46? Because 23 come from mom. We call those maternal. And 23 come from dad. And we call those paternal. Now, 
This is your, um, let's call it your DNA fingerprint. Um, I don't really like using that word, but it's what we use in like common everyday language. It's your DNA profile, these 46 chromosomes. And a lot of confusion comes because we don't know what is the difference between a chromosome and a chromatin network. The main difference is a chromosome is made up of a piece of the chromatin network that's condensed and formed a chromosome. So technically, the chromatin network is a long piece of DNA, and then we cut it up into 46 pieces, and we condense them into these rod-shaped chromosomes. And that is where your DNA is housed and kept. But now what we need to do, and generally this is as far as you've gone in like grade 10, what we need to do is we are going to zoom in on the chromatin network and we are going to actually look at what is DNA actually made out of. Okay, so um, first things first, let's actually break down what DNA stands for. Some of us may have already learned it, but it stands for deoxy ribonucleic acid. I know it's a very, very, very long word, but essentially um, what it is, is it's dividing the actual structure. So what you have here is deoxy, which means it's got one less oxygen. Ribo, which refers to the sugar it is made out of. And then nucleic acid refers to the type of um, uh, ooh, uh, the type of molecule that we're making. So it is deoxyribonucleic acid. Now you're probably thinking, when are we allowed to use this long name and when can we use just plain old DNA? You are allowed to use DNA whenever you're writing paragraphs, sentences, anything like that, um, or labels. What I suggest you don't ever do is use this for terminology sections. So, you know, in your paper, you'll have a terminology section. Generally, it's question 1.2. You need to give this full um, name if they ask you what it is. Don't ever give abbreviations in terminology. Okay, so this is just a little bit of recap of what you should already know and what you may remember from grade 10, but I know grade 10 was a very long time ago for some of us. So let's get into some closer detail in what we see. Now, what we have in front of us over here is the two forms that nucleic acids can come in. So what we're doing here is we are super zooming onto a piece of the chromatin network. And I'm going to start with this one because it is more familiar to us. This here is a DNA strand. And you might be very familiar with this picture. You may have seen models of it. Now we've super zoomed onto a section of the chromatin network. And we are looking at a section of it. And we're just going to call this a DNA molecule. I say molecule and I don't say strand because they are not the same thing and I'll also clarify that for you soon. So our DNA molecule over here, you will notice has this twisted shape, which is a very defining quality of DNA and we call it a double helix. And essentially what that is, is if you were to like draw it out by hand, you would do something like this, and that mimics the sort of double helix shape of it. It's a twisty ladder. Now, you'll also notice there are some of these um, colorful components on the inside over here, and I'm going to get to what those are very soon. And the other structural component is this green sort of ribbon structure on the outside. And so DNA is made out of um, smaller little building blocks that I'm going to unpack for you soon. And then I'm going to explain to you why DNA is structured the way it is. Now, I want to show you the sister to DNA, which is this one alongside here. This is called RNA. Now, I hope if you just have a look at it here, you can see some differences, but also a couple of similarities. You will notice that DNA is double-stranded. There are two green ribbons here. So we've got a double strand. Whereas RNA is a single strand. 
Now, I'm just introducing you to RNA now. Um, RNA needs its own separate explanation, but they are sisters to one another. And essentially, RNA is built very similar to DNA. The only difference is, is that it's one single strand, as you can see here. And if I go in a little bit closer, you can see we've got the little ribbon running in the back, just like the DNA had. And it also has these components, the colorful components running down the middle. But you'll notice, though, there is the other side missing. There's the second piece that is missing, and that is very unique to RNA. Again, I'm going to clarify why as we get on to this lesson and as we move on. But these are the two that we are going to work with today, and I'm going to explain their structure and their purpose. We're going to start with DNA because it's easier. And then we'll move into RNA because it's a little bit more complicated, especially its purpose. So let's have a little closer look, shall we, at DNA. So this is my strand of DNA over here. It is a double helix. It's still wound up. But what we've done here is we have flattened it out. So we've taken this and we flattened it so it's not curved around itself. And now we get this ladder appearance. Now, this is what DNA will look like if we stretch it out. And again, we can see the two ribbon pieces. Here is one on this side and here is the other ribbon piece. And then we have the colorful components running down the middle, which we um, sometimes call like a rung of a ladder. So, you know, like the pieces that go across a ladder. And this is now getting into the new work of grade 12, the structure of DNA. Now, if we are going to do the structure, we're going to have to super zoom really close and we need to break down this structure right here. One of these, one building block or one component of a piece of DNA. So what are these components called? One component or one building block of DNA is called a nucleotide. Now, a nucleotide is a monomer of DNA, okay? Monomer, big fancy word for saying building block. Just like amino acids are monomers of proteins, nucleotides are building blocks or monomers of DNA. Now, a nucleotide is a little brick or a small component that when stacked on top of each other, many nucleotides will make a piece of DNA. As you can see here, we've got many nucleotides stacked on top of each other. Now, the nucleotides that we find in DNA are very specific and they have a pattern that they follow. And I'm going to use shapes so you understand what a nucleotide is made out of. So it's made out of three components. The first component is a circular structure, and this is made out of a phosphate. So P stands for phosphate. Then attached to that is going to be a sugar. And we always draw the sugar as a sort of um, a hexagon. Oh, sorry, a pentagon, I beg your pardon, um, a little pentagon sugar. And I'm just going to put here S, and the S stands for sugar. And the final component is going to be something called a nitrogenous base. And I'm just going to put here NB, and NB stands for nitrogenous base. Okay, and there's some clues in their names as to like, you know, what they're obviously made out of. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit further as well. So we've got a phosphate, which is attached to a sugar, and that sugar is attached to something called a nitrogenous base. The name nitrogenous means it's made out of nitrogen. Now, this is one singular nucleotide. I know in bio it's really complicated because it always feels like one structure is made up of small things that's made up of more small things that's made up of more small things. And it just it feels like it becomes overwhelming, right? Luckily, we're not going to get any smaller than this. And this is one nucleotide. So if we are looking back at our diagram up here, 
this, if I just try and get just the yellow piece and not the orange, that is one nucleotide. And on the other side here, that's also a nucleotide. And here is another nucleotide. And here is a second nucleotide. So there's actually four here. Okay. Now, how do those four link in with my diagram here? Well, if I wanted to add another um, nucleotide below it, all I'm going to do is add in another phosphate over here. I'm going to add in another sugar over here. And I'm going to add in another nitrogenous base. And so on and so forth. And I can just add and add and add and add and add more and more. And we would continue the chain. But I want you to know that this is just one side of the DNA. In other words, if we look back at my diagram from earlier, I'm only drawing, let's say, this side. I'm only drawing this side. If I want to draw the other side, I now need to draw it in mirror image on the other side. So let me show you what that would look like if we zoom in over here. That would look like a nitrogenous base connecting to a sugar, connecting to a phosphate. And then we would do it again, nitrogenous base, connecting to a sugar, connecting to a phosphate. And then these are joined together and so on and so forth. And so either side of our DNA is a let's call it a mirror image of itself in that it has the same structure going down the left and going down the right. Okay. Now, there's one last important piece about these nucleotides that we need to talk about before we can talk about how we make DNA work for us. Like what does it actually do? So right now, this is the general structure of a piece of DNA. And these are our building blocks, the nucleotides. Now, let's talk about these nitrogenous bases, these guys over here. There are four kinds of nitrogenous bases, and they have names. And their names are a little bit weird, but um, they're actually very easy and memorable because they're so unusual. The nitrogenous bases that we get are thymine. We get adenine. Oops, add a mean. That's an E. We get cytosine. And we get guanine. Okay. Those are our four kinds. So what that means is, if we look at our diagram, any one of these nitrogenous bases could be thymines, adenines, cytosines, or guanine. So we can just interchange them. There is a special way that you allocate them, and I'm going to cover that now too. But I want you to think of these NBs, or these nitrogenous base um, labels, as placeholders. Like, I can substitute in a thymine into one of these or an adenine into one of these. Okay. So these are our nitrogenous base options. There are four of them. And um, we also talk about them abbreviated. And you are allowed to use these letters, their first letters, as a way to abbreviate them when you are um, like talking about them in maybe a sentence. My suggestion, however, is stick to the full names. Um, I would only ever, ever, ever suggest using the letters when we start to talk about DNA code, and that's going to be something I'm going to still do in this lesson now, but I would always use the full words if you are labeling, if you are writing a paragraph. The only time I would use the letters is if I am going to write a piece of code, and I'm going to show you what I mean by how do you write a piece of code. So, speaking of writing code, these nitrogenous bases, the four of them, they actually complement each other, which means they have partners, and these are their only partners. They are not allowed to join with other nitrogenous bases in DNA. They must join together. And so what's very convenient is thymine and adenine are partners to one another, and cytosine 
and guanin are partners. So, ma'am, what do you mean by partners? Well, if we look back at our structure over here, these are our nitrogenous bases, and we say that they are complementary to one another, or they're complementary base pairs. What that means is, going off of what we've just heard now, T always joins to A, or A always joins to T, whichever way it's written, and C always joins with G, or G always joins with C, whether you're reading it that way as well. Now, this over here, if we substituted, whoops, if we substituted these letters in here, that would mean I would have, let's say, for example, a thymine on this side and an adenine on that side. And that is the only possible combination. It could also have been A and T here, but remember, they are complementary. They are the only ones that can join together. If we go down lower, this could be C and this could be G. So that's cytosine and that's guanine. Again, they could be swapped around, but um, they can never be C and A or G and T. That never works. That combination never, ever, ever works. Okay, so I'm going to pause for a second because I want to have a look at our questions. And if anyone does have questions, you can put it in the chat and I will be able to have a look at what you want to know. So let's have a look here. I've got to scroll all the way up to the top and just have a little look ski. Okay, let's see, anybody? All right, Blake asked, is the red nucleotide made up of two? Uh, I think you were talking about this one when we were still over here. Yes, this is made out of two pieces. It's a pink and a red one next to one another. They are not, they are not actually separate. Um, they are separate, I beg your pardon. But I think I clarified that already. Um, I don't think there's any other questions. Uh, Antoinette, unfortunately, I don't have a, a Kofi account. Okay. All right. So I don't think there's any questions right now, and that's okay. Um, if you are lost, please let me know and put a little point um, for me to clarify if you're not so certain. But I think it's been pretty straightforward till now. Now, what is the point of, if we zoom out so you can see this as like a collective, what is the point of having all of this code and all of these structures? Right. So now we need to take the structure of DNA and use it for its function. We learned all the way back, sure, in grade eight or nine, right, that um, DNA is the code of life. It is the coding to make every single part of you. Now, when we talk about the code of life, what we're actually talking about now that we're in grade 12 and we're just a little bit more advanced is these um, letterings over here. These are thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. That is the code of life. Every single living organism on earth, whether you are bacteria, a mushroom, a dog, a human, it doesn't matter, you all have these four letters in your DNA. And the lettering is thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. We abbreviate them with the letters T, A, C, and G. And these are how they partner together. T always joins with A, or A joins with T. C joins with G, or G joins with C. They never mix with one another. In other words, cytosine will never join with any of these two, and guanine will never join with these two, and vice versa. Now, if we look back at our structure of DNA, and I placed our structure of DNA, and I flattened it out here, you can see the nitrogenous bases, which is what I've just spoken about. These are the nitrogenous bases here. You will see that I 
use them as placeholders for the actual names of the bases, which is thymine and adenine, cytosine and guanine. Now, these letters, right, they are the code of life. Everything is written in these four letters. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but yes, it's true. That means that there is infinite combinations that can be made. Well, infinite maybe is excessive, but a huge, an enormous amount of combinations. Now, you're probably thinking, but man, there's only four letters. How can there be infinite, infinite combinations? Well, that comes down to a process we're not going to do today, but that comes down to something called protein synthesis and how we take these four letters and we synthesize things, how we make new structures. So let me show you some of the code in action so we better understand the function of DNA okay so let me show you here let me draw you a very basic piece of DNA so this is the backbone of the DNA this is where the sugar and phosphate would be and I'm going to flatten it out and I'm going to put in my nitrogenous bases just on their own for simplicity okay like so. And then now remember, they are complementary or they have a complementary side to them. So that means that I've got to put T on this side because A joins with T. If this is a T, this must be an A. Let me just actually draw this line down. Here we go. If this is a G, this must be a C. If this is a C, this must be a G. This is a C, must be a G. This is an A must be a T. Okay, so I want you to imagine now that this is a piece of our DNA, it's a piece of our coding, and I've just put the nitrogenous base letters because it makes our lives so much easier right now to just work with the letters only. Um, I've omitted all the other structures, I've left them out. So what you see here is a piece of DNA and its code. And let's say hypothetically, this set of lettering, this section of your DNA is the code for your, let's say, eye color. Okay, so if we read this code and we give the reading to someone, that someone being yourself, it will read the letters and it will produce your eye color for you. It will produce the pigment that makes your, your eyes the color they are. Now, this code is a universal code, okay? It means that every single organism is written in the same four letters. Now, if you think about it, if this is the recipe for your eye color, you would want to protect it right? You would not want any of these letters to fall off, to go missing, to disappear. That would be massively detrimental. So how do we keep it compact? How do we keep it closed? How do we keep it safe? Well, if these are my nucleotides, this is one nucleotide here and here is the other, I need to keep these two pieces closed together. And so what they have attached in the middle here, which I'm just going to draw as a dotted line in between them, is a bond. And this bond holding them together is called a hydrogen bond. And that hydrogen bond keeps the code of your DNA safely locked together, okay? Because if it wasn't locked together, what you would end up having is if this is like a piece of your DNA and these pieces are locked together, but then these pieces are broken open at the top. If you break it open like this, you run the risk of completely destroying and losing a piece of your DNA, which we don't want to do. Remember, it's the recipe for you. It is the code for life. If you lose the code for life, you end up accumulating lots of mutations and changes, and eventually they can be really detrimental to you, and it can lead to 
aging. It can lead to cancer. It can lead to harmful mutations that lead to disorders. So we don't want to lose any DNA. And so to prevent the loss of any of these codes, any of these letters, we have a hydrogen bond that holds them together and keeps them safe. We take it one step further, as I mentioned earlier. Oops, just locked my iPad, sorry. As I mentioned earlier, and that is we have a double helix. So not only do we keep our DNA strand together with a hydrogen bond in the middle, we even wrap it around itself and we twist it and we make a double helix. And this is the basics around the structure of DNA, what it's made out of, and what it does. Now I'm going to have a look back at our questions and have a look at what we want to know. Right. All right, Nala, this will be uploaded. Don't worry. Uh, right, so why can't T be with G? Right, great question. I'll go back here. So this question was about why can't T be with G and, and maybe A with C? That has to do with their structures. I'm not going to get into the details of that because that would really take a huge chunk of this lesson for me to explain it in. And that would be a follow-up lesson, definitely. But I'll give you the basics. Essentially, these um, nitrogenous bases are paired together. So as we know, these two go together and these two go together. The reason why, um, like for example, thymine and cytosine, they can't go together is because they are, um, let's compare it to magnets, if you will. Do you remember learning in physics, a, a magnet has a north and a south pole on it? And um, in order for magnets to work, you've got to put opposite sides towards each other. So to attract each other, it's got to be a south and a north. It's the same idea with the nitrogenous bases. The thymine and the adenine are north and south to one another. So they attract each other, like my magnets here. If, however, you wanted to, as you suggested, put, for example, thymine and cytosine together, they are the same ends of a magnet. So what happens is they repel or they move away from each other. They don't want to go together. And so that is why thymine can't go with cytosine, thymine can't go with guanine, likewise adenine can't go with cytosine, and adenine can't go with guanine. They repel each other. They, are, they, they will not want to go together. Right. That's our first question that I've answered. Let's have a back look here and see. Okay. Um, somebody asked, where is DNA found? Um, that was right at the beginning of the lesson. I mentioned to you that DNA is found inside the nucleus. If we zoom in on the nucleus over here, we have a long string called the chromatin network, which is made up of DNA. So they are the same thing. We just call a long piece of DNA the chromatin network. And that is where we find DNA. All right, let's go back into the questions. Um, right. Yes, this live will be available after we're done. Yes, gift it is found in the nucleus. Uh, why is hydrogen bond you? I don't know what what you mean by there, Shlobani. If you could just write your question again. It's missing a little bit at the end. Um, so, Michaela, is it doubles a helix for extra strength? Yes, it is. Lovely question. So if we go and have a look here, here is our lovely piece of DNA. It is double stranded and double helix for extra strength because when it's straight or when it looks like a ladder, so when it's like this, it's a little bit weaker than when it's nicely wound up and, and tied together. We don't want it to stay like this for too long. Otherwise, we will damage it. Right. Let's have a look at another question. Um, oh, there we go. Shlobani said use. Let me just have a look back at Shlobani. Where did you ask that question, Shlobani? Why is hydrogen bond used? So why is the hydrogen bond used? Lovely question, okay? Why do we use the hydrogen bond? So 
what's fascinating about, and some of you might do physics as well, so you might be wondering why hydrogen. Okay, why hydrogen? Hydrogen loves to join with everybody. Everybody, everybody, everybody. If you know anything about physics, um, you will know it is right at the beginning of the periodic table. Um, and it has a affinity, which means it really likes to attach to other structures. Because of this quality, oops, because of this quality to want to attach to anything, it really works well as like a glue, right? To put our uh, nitrogenous bases together. So hydrogen is a perfect substance to do this. Um, it is also weak enough, which is great, to be broken by a special enzyme. So a special enzyme can come down here and break these bonds. Now, why would we want to break the hydrogen bonds? That is another lesson for another day, but that is called protein synthesis. That would be the next section that you're going to learn after the structure of DNA. You would go into protein synthesis. So why hydrogen? Because it's freely available, it's easy to connect with, um, and it's fairly strong because it can make covalent bonds. If you know anything about physics, you also know about covalent bonding. Um, but if you don't know, it basically means it can hold things really well together and bond. But it's not too strong that it's impossible to break because we do have to break the DNA open sometimes for special um, synthesizing reasons. Okay, let's go down here. Can the high, okay, I just answered Hannah's question. Can it be broken? Yes, it does. It will break for protein synthesis um, because we need to get to the letters. I want you to imagine, and if you're thinking, why do you break the hydrogen then? Um, I want you to imagine that each of these are like a page in a book. Um, you almost need to like open the book. So right now, if you look at a library, there are books on a shelf and these books are closed to you, just like the DNA is closed. If I want to read the code, I have to open the pages. And the only way to open the pages or open the DNA is to break this bond down the middle so I can read the letters. Hope that clarifies for you as well. When and why we would do it. Okay, let's have a look here. Right. Um, what is the significance of weak hydrogen bonds? Just so that they can be easily broken, that's all. Um, how does it having a double helix provide an advantage? Great question. Um, it provides a, a spring-like action. Um, so what that means is if it's a double helix, it's wound itself around like that. I want you to imagine like a force from the top and a force from the bottom. It's like a spring um, it has a lot of resistance that way. Um, another thing that makes it a lot stronger being double helixed is that, and I don't want to overwhelm you with new information, but I'll answer for you, for those of you who um, may be able to get this off the bat and not need any more elaboration. But the double helix allows for, let's say, a copy of the DNA to be kept that's useless. Um, and that might be a little bit confusing right now because we don't know what I'm talking about, but basically you'll notice that there are two sides to the DNA. One side is actually the useful side. The other side is actually just a copy of the other. It's like a soft copy. Um, it's there for preservation. And so the double helix provides structural support but it also provides integrity to the code. It provides a, a copy of it. In case you lose the one side, you have the other side as a backup. Okay, I've tried to keep that as simple as possible without going too in-depth right now. Okay, here we go. Um, let's see, more questions. Right, what can happen um, if T joins with C or C joins with T? It doesn't happen. There is no nothingness. If, if there is no complementary base, then it doesn't join everybody. It doesn't happen is what I'm saying. So I know you're asking, but what if it happens? It, it doesn't happen. Point blank. It doesn't happen. Okay, let's have a look at some more questions. 
All right, Sub-Zero says, in chemistry last year, they said when nitrogen bonds with hydrogen, it's a strong bond because it's a hydrogen bond. I know, right? Okay, so this is the, the argument that biologists have with physics teachers. They're not wrong. We're not teaching you different things. But now this is the complexity that I, I'm scared to get into in this kind of lesson because I just want to keep this lesson fairly, you know, relaxed and easy breezy. But if you're asking, I will um, elaborate. In physics, we're taught that hydrogen bonds are some of the strongest bonds we can make. But now I'm saying that these are weak. Right. So what you need to understand is whenever you refer to a bond, you refer to it in reference to the bonds surrounding it. So hydrogen bonds in general are strong, in general. But if I, compete, if I compare the hydrogen bonds in DNA to the bonds around it, it's weak. So this bond is weak compared to this bond over here, which if you remember from the structure earlier is a phosphate, and a sugar. That bond, this bond here, is much stronger than the, str uh, than the hydrogen bond running down through the middle. So the, the word weak or strong is just in reference to the other bonds around it. Uh, hopefully that doesn't confuse too many of you. Um, I'm not trying to make it too complicated today. All right, um, let's have a look. All right. Can you explain the ladder structure of DNA? I'm a little confused. No problem. We'll do the ladder structure one more time. So if I drew it in like its actual components, this is the ladder structure of DNA. I'm drawing the one side and I'm drawing the other side. Just give me a hot second to quickly draw a couple of pieces. So this is the, let me zoom in a bit. There is my ladder structure. And then this would be a little hydrogen bond joining it in the middle. If I didn't draw it as fancy like this, this is just the ladder structure here. This would be, let's say, A and T, and um, I'll just make this T and A. And this is what it would look like if I drew the structure like that. So this is the more complex molecular structure where I've drawn um, symbols to represent the different substances. Phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous base, nitrogenous base, sugar, phosphate. This is just the simplified version where I have omitted all those pictures and I have just included our nitrogenous bases. Okay, right, let's have a look at some more questions. Okay, let's have a look. If the hydrogen bonds break, will it be fatal? No, it's not, don't worry. Um, it's a, it sounds funny, but these bonds that hold your DNA together, the ones that we spoke about earlier, these guys over here that I sort of put, let me actually just put them in a different color so you can actually see there's a bond here and there's a bond there. Um, those bonds must break uh, temporarily so that we can actually access the letters. Because as I said to you earlier, it's like a book in a page. In a, in a, it's like a page in a book. You have to crack open the book in order to read the individual pages. It's the same with DNA. You have to actually break the bonds to read the letters. All right, let's have another little squiz here at the questions. But don't worry, it's not fatal. Um... All right. I again, a lot of people are asking me the same questions over and over again about the hydrogen bonds. It is a weak hydrogen bond. And for the chemistry folks who've learned that it's a strong hydrogen bond, you're not wrong, but it's just in context. These bonds are weak compared to the phosphates and the sugars in DNA. That's all the main difference. Okay. Right, let's have a look at some more questions. Uh, what's the name of the special enzyme that can break down the hydrogen bond? If you really must know, um, it depends on what it is um, you're doing. So it could be transcriptase, it could be DNA polymerase, 
They're very big names. Good news, everybody. You don't need to know the names of the enzymes. You just need to know um, that they're an enzyme. And that's basically it. All right, ma'am, how do you, how does Eurosol bond? Okay, Anika, you are asking a, a more advanced question. And so I'm not going to be talking about Eurosol today. Um, yes, is the copy in case one side is damaged? Technically, yes. So we've got a copy on the other side here. This is technically a copy and this is like the, the original this is in case the side gets damaged or likewise if this side gets damaged you have another piece on the other side just in case to fix any pieces missing okay let's go back to our question how would you lose the other side um aging um you take uh, mutagens like sunlight chemicals um and just by accident sometimes a little piece can fall off um, Paul, am I going to do DNA replication today? No, I'm not. So the bond is strong enough to hold, but weak enough. Yes. Uh, Anusha says, so the bond is strong enough to hold, but weak enough to be broken by protein synthesis. Yes. Perfect understanding. This is not for grade 11s. This is for grade 12s, everyone, just so you know. Is there a case where bonds don't break? Um, yes, if you don't have the enzyme, which is uh, a bit of a problem because then you can't go through synthesis. Uh, Tristan asks, what is being used to keep the phosphate, sugar and nitrogenous string together? That's actually a lovely question. I don't think I actually told everybody like what holds all of the, the side here together. So what he's asking is what's holding this together, you know, the backbone. And that's actually what it's called. This backbone here is called the sugar phosphate backbone. And literally it is these phosphates making an incredibly strong bond with each other and with their sugars, which creates almost like a spine or a backbone. And this phosphate backbone is really hard to break everybody it's much harder to break than the weak hydrogen bond in the middle that's easier to break and that's why we call it weak because in comparison this bond is weaker than these bonds that's why we can call it weak you're just comparing one bond to another that's why okay let's have a look at some more questions don't, uh, Tabisa, will I be doing more live lessons? Yes, I will. Uh, the bond is um, in between here. Yeah, it is a covalent bond, but we don't need to know the name of our bonding. All right. And TB, I'm just having a look. Or oh, TB, I'm looking at your question. Says the picture ladder containing nucleotides the one that is in a slide of dna and rna i don't understand that picture with the nucleotides with the colors okay i'll go back for you flobani is this the same phosphate found in atp yes it is flobani it's exactly the same uh gifts uh, i don't see the rest of your question gift sorry it's not coming up all right, let me go back here. I think this is the one maybe, is it this the one that's confusing us? I think so. So just to clarify, here is our DNA strand all wound up, right? And then what we did was we just took a section of it and, I, and we flattened it out here. It's flat here. So these little colorful pieces in the middle, that's what these are. And then this green ribbon is this blue ribbon structure running down the back of each side. And so what I'm drawing sometimes for you is this way. I think maybe, I don't know if it's an orientation problem, but when I draw my ladder, this is what it looks like. This is the ladder. And so if I, I'm just going to rub this all off and make it even easier. This is a nitrogenous base. This is a nitrogenous base. There will be a sugar here and a phosphate here. 
like that. And then they join. And then there will be another, oops, let's undo that. There'll be another phosphate here, and then another sugar here, and then here is a nitrogenous base. So we could go like T, A, C, G, G, C. Let's do a few more just to show you what it looks like on the ladder. Uh, this is a G, by the way. Um, T, A, T, A, and so on. Okay. Am I answering your question on this ladder? I think I am. Okay. And that, if I, I think I have answered your question on this ladder. Um, if that is all we need to clarify today, then I'm going to end the lesson there, unless there's more questions about DNA. Tobeka asks, so the phosphate molecule of one nucleotide bonds with the phosphate of another nucleotide to make the sugar phosphate backbone? Yes, yes, they do. Yes, yes, yes. Just like I'm sort of like roughly drawing over here. That's exactly how it works. Um, Gif said something about accommodative lessons for visual impaired, especially blind ones also starting. Oh, yes. So um, I have some good news also is for um, here uh, for my sight impaired learners so people who are listening to this video rather than watching it i'm actually going to change my setup quite a bit this year through the live lessons um, i'm actually going to be almost streaming the lessons now like you know you get like uh, people who stream gaming i'll be streaming my lessons i think that will be really cool and so in that the sound will be better, the vocalization will be better, you will be able to um, hear me a lot more clearly, because if you can't see the visuals, it's important for me to also be heard well. Okay, ma'am, why is there a pattern in the DNA strands? I don't know what you mean by your question, Zeba, you have to ask me that in a better way. What would happen if the phosphate is broken? Okay, good question, Kanye. I did cover this a little bit earlier, but if this breaks, so this phosphate backbone breaks, what happens is, if I just redraw it here, and you can see it like pulling away and breaking, so like it's breaking here, or potentially a little chunk breaks off over there. See, like this was attached over here, and now it's broken off. So that means that like this piece here was cut. You lose this piece of DNA. Now, I don't need you to panic because, yes, there are letters on the end of this that you've lost. So you've lost a couple of pages of your book. But don't worry because generally you have the pages on the other side, which were complementary to it, that we haven't lost. So a little enzyme comes along and it gets rid of your problem over here and it goes, oh, no, this piece has been lost and this little enzyme rebuilds this side for you and it puts it back together again. Okay, that process happens every single day of your life, so don't worry about it. You lose pieces every day. That's actually what aging is. Aging is losing these pieces slowly but surely. Okay, let's have a look here. Right, do we have a schedule for the lessons? Um, at this point, not yet. Generally, I like to do live lessons um, on a Wednesday. Um, that's my most common time to do it, but I also do it on Saturdays, uh, Saturday mornings as well. I, I, by the way, I don't just surprise everyone with this, the schedule. I, I post it on the community page so you know when we're doing a lesson. Okay, the red and pink ones uh, have a look, ha, have a look, have a bookmarker form. Oh, and the orange and green also. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so um, we're talking about this shape over here. This is to just show that they're complementary, that they lock into one another. So that's why we spoke about it earlier. 
um, that we just need to complement each other. I know that the pattern is not perfect all the way down. It's okay. Um, I haven't matched it to the colors. Um, but if it's really bothering you because the lettering is not matching the colors and the shapes, let me make it perfect for you. This can be G and this can be C and G. That means this red one will be C. This will be G. Now, if I go with this, don't worry about the colors not being the same. It's really not that deep, everybody. This can be T. This can be A. This can be A. This can be T. Uh, this can be T. This can be A. This can be... Uh, this is A and this is T. So it's really not that deep. Don't worry too much about the colors. But this is... If I just did the colors with the pair bonds, red and pink are G and C, and... Yellow, orange, green are T and A. Don't worry about the fact that they are different colors. It's just a, a flaw in the diagram, I suppose. Okay. I think I'm going to have one or two more questions here. What if your body is low on phosphorus? Nah, don't worry, Kaylee. You don't need to worry about your phosphorus being too low. Um, you get a lot of phosphorus out of your diet. A lot of vegetables have phosphorus, so don't even stress. Uh... Right, the bond holding together the sugar phosphate together is a covalent bond, but we don't have to know that. No, we don't, Hannah. Don't worry. You don't have to know any of the classifications of the bonds that hold this together. The only bond you need to know is this bond here, which was the weak hydrogen bond. Whoops. Right, let's have a look at another question. Let's see. All right, um... The cheat sheet, everybody, is available for you to buy on my website if you'd really like it. Um, it's also for free if you're a member um, of my Rescue Me membership on YouTube. Um, you get access to it for free if you're a member. Um, and basically, it makes bio incredibly simple because I've taken your 200-page textbook and I've simplified it down into concise summaries, everything you need to know, I've left out everything you don't need to know. Um, I've told you how to answer questions. I've told you how to solve complex genetic problems, all sorts of things like that. All right. So when the phosphate bond breaks, the copy, yes. Yes. So when the phosphate bond breaks, uh, the copy of the bond works double time to bring back what was lost. Yes, it does. How much is the subscription? Uh, the subscription is 150 Rand. Right. Uh, Phoenix, yes, you can just replace as long as you are replacing. If it if an A was lost, it must be replaced with an A. It just can't, it can't be another random letter. However, what's interesting is sometimes you lose both of these, T and A, and you don't always get a T and A back. Um, you might get a G and a C back up here, but that's another lesson for another day. That is when you'll only do that in genetics much later in the year. All right, last few questions, and then we're going to end this live. Does the broken phosphate bond disappear? Yes, it does. It just gets broken down. So the question was, like, what happens to this if we break it down? The sugar and the phosphate are just waste products, and we recycle them. How complicated is this topic? Uh, Kaval, this topic is not too complicated. Um, it might be overwhelming now because it's the first time you're hearing everything, so... But you will see that when you do this again in class, even if you remember some of the things I've said today, you'll be already a step ahead of everybody else. In comparison, DNA structure uh, and replication is one of the easiest topics you'll do in grade 12. Um, protein synthesis, which is the section after this under DNA, is a little bit more complicated. I would say the hardest topics are always genetics, um, human reproduction, and... Uh, the nervous system. Those are the, for my students, they're the, the most dreaded of the topics. All right. Uh, is it possible for DNA to only have A and T? No, it's not possible. A and T. So the question was, can you have a piece of DNA that's only made up of A and T? No, you need G's and C's too. Right, Angela, am I wrong to say that the double helix is the shape for the DNA? Or is it the other way around? The, the double helix is the shape for DNA, yes. Anybody can join, any kind of student, doesn't matter what province you come from, we all learn the same thing. 
How do you become a member? You can become a member um, on my homepage on my YouTube. Often the, the it's like a blue button. It's a different colored button to the subscribe button. It says join. If it's not on your phone, it might be because you're on like an iPhone. Generally Android phones, the button is there. But um, sometimes I suggest joining via like a, a computer because it's a little bit easier and the button is there. Okay. All right, Kaval, do I know what you're going to be covering in term one? Generally, you cover um, DNA, you cover meiosis, and then you cover reproduction. Um, different schools do different things. Uh, my school, we change it up in the middle of the year, and we do a different order. We do genetics, and then we do evolution. Um, but then in other schools, they stick very, very firmly to what the government, in the order the government wants it to be taught. So that's dependent on your school. But it's very safe to say, you should all be starting with DNA. Day one, that is what you'll be doing. Okay. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming for the live. Um, and I will see you all again soon. Keep your eyes peeled to the community page. That's where I post when we're going to have another live lesson. We'll probably move into then RNA in our next lesson because today we did DNA. And the next lesson, we're going to do RNA. Um, and I will see you all again soon. Bye.